So in this video, I want to talk about logarithms and more specifically what it means to take the logarithm of a complex number. I'll show you how to do it, but first we'll need to be very careful about how we actually do it because we will run into some problems along the way. So let's look at the equation y equals e to the x, where y is some positive real number and x is any real number. Now what we would usually do to simply solve this equation is just take logarithms of both sides. So if we do that, we would get the log of y is equal to x. And the inverse function of the exponential function we know is the logarithm function. But suppose now I ask you to solve the equation, let's say w equals e to the z, where w and z are complex numbers. So in other words, w is uh, u plus iv, and z is x plus iy. So these are complex numbers. Well, what we'd like to do, as we did in the real case, was to take logarithms of both sides. But we can't quite do that yet, because we haven't actually defined what that means. So let's first look at e to the z. So let's look at e to the z. Let's plug in different values of z. Is this, a, is this an injective function? In other words, is it 1 to 1? Well, we know that e to the 0 is just 1. Anything to the power of 0 is just 1. Well, we also know that e to the 2 pi i is 1. And we know that e to the 4 pi i is the same as e to the 2 pi i or squared. And that's just 1 squared, which is 1. And likewise, e to the 6 pi i is 1, e to the 8 pi i is 1, e to the 10 pi i is 1, e to the minus 2 pi i is 1, and so on and so forth. So we've got a bit of a problem here. If e to the z isn't even injective, meaning 1 to 1, then how can we possibly talk about having an inverse? All of these different things, e to the 0, e to the 2 pi i, map to the value 1. So we can't possibly have an inverse. Well, there is a way to get around this issue, and I'll show you how to do it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'll let w be a complex number, as above, but I'll let w be non-zero, because if it is zero, I will run into a problem taking logarithms. Since w is a complex number, let me write w uh, be equal to r e to the i theta. If you're not familiar with this form, here r is just the modulus of w, so that's the length of uh, this complex number w, and this theta is the argument of w. So theta is the argument of w. <clears throat> and later I'll have to be very careful about what I mean when I say arguments, but let me first do uh, something else. Okay, so let's look at e to the z. Well, remember earlier I had e to the z equals w. So if e to the z equals w, then I have that e to the z is r e to the i theta. But I know that e to the i theta can be expressed in another form. I can express it as the cos of theta plus i sine of theta. So this is the same as r times the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta. Okay, so that's the right hand side. What about the left hand side? Well, before I wrote z equal to x plus i y, so let's expand the left hand side using x and y. Well e to the z is the same as e to the x plus i y, but that's the same as e to the x times e to the i y. But e to the i y is just the cosine of y plus i sine of y for exactly the same reason as above, just with y instead of theta. So this is the same as e to the x times the cosine of y plus i sine of y. So, uh, in summary, what I want to solve is e to the x cos y plus i sine y. When is this equal to r times the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta? Well, clearly I've got to have e to the x equals r. So let me just highlight that. I need to have e to the x equals r. So I need to have e to the x equals r. But you might notice something here. Z is x plus i y, meaning x and y are just real numbers. So x is a real number. Likewise, r is also a real number. In fact, it's more than that, it's a positive number. Remember I took w to be non-zero, so r can't be zero either. It can't have zero length. 
So this is some positive real number. But I don't have to deal with this. I can just take logarithms of both sides. I'm only dealing with real numbers here. So if I do that, I'll just get x equals the natural log of r. And the natural log of r is just the natural log of the modulus of w. So this is just the log of w. So now I've found uh, an expression for x. I now need to do the same thing for y. So now I need to look at this. I need to find when is the cosine of y equal to the cosine of theta? And when is the sine of y equal to the sine of theta? Well, what you might say is that, well, obviously it's y equals theta. But that's not exactly the case. We know that cosine and sine are two pi periodic functions. And if you don't know what that means, let me just draw a picture here to remind you. If I drew a graph of sine, you know, it looks something like this. So this is, uh, this is zero, this is pi, this is two pi. You know that it's two pi periodic. In other words, it repeats every two pi. And so I can draw the next interval from two pi to four pi. So this is four pi and I can do it again. So if I do it again, that's six pi and it repeats in this fashion. Likewise, cosine is also two pi periodic. So what do I get? So when is cosine of y equal to the cosine of theta? I must have y equals theta plus 2k pi, where k is some integer. This notation means k is just some integer, 1, 2, 0, minus 1, minus 2, and so forth. So y is equal to theta plus 2k pi. But now I've actually solved this equation. I've got an expression for z. I've got z is equal to x plus i y, which is the logarithm r, or logarithm of the modulus of w, plus i y, which I'll just say is the argument of w. Now then, this expression is not actually unique in its imaginary part. Its argument is determined up to 2k pi. So this expression is not unique, and that's a problem. So in order for our definition to make sense, we need to define what's called the principal logarithm. So let's do that. So I'm going to define the principal logarithm. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll let w, or actually, uh, yeah, let's use w. Let w be some complex number that is non-zero. That's what this notation means. w is any complex number apart from zero, because the logarithm of zero is not defined. So I'm going to define the log of this complex number w to be the logarithm of the absolute value of w plus i times the argument of w. But what do I mean by this argument? Well, I have to impose a restriction on this argument, otherwise I've got a problem. Otherwise, logarithm is not an inverse of the exponential. So how do I do this? Well, I'm going to impose the restriction minus pi is less than the argument of w is less than or equal to pi. <coughs> And this is the crucial point. The reason I impose this inequality is so that my argument doesn't overlap itself, so that my expression is unique. It still has a, a range of 2 pi. So now since I've done that, I've now got an expression for the inverse function for e to the z. That's good. So let's do some examples using the principal logarithm. Let's try to find the logarithm of, let's say, i. So what is the logarithm of i. We're using my formula above, that's just the logarithm of the absolute value of i plus i times the argument of i. Let me just draw a picture here so you can see what I'm doing. So this is the point i in the complex plane. Well, the absolute value of i is just 1. It has a modulus of 1. So this is just the logarithm of 1 plus i times the argument of i. So what is the angle between here and here? What is this angle? Well, clearly it's a right angle and it has value pi over 2. 
Now this is also a crucial point. I could also have quite clearly said that this uh, this angle here could have been 5 pi over 2 or 9 pi over 2 or minus 3 pi over 2 or any um, I could add any multiple of 2 pi to this thing. But since I've imposed a restriction, minus pi is less than the argument of w, which is less than or equal to pi, on the principal logarithm, then I no longer have this problem. So I can only take this value for the angle. So the argument of i is just pi over 2, in the case of the principal logarithm. So that's i pi over 2. The logarithm of 1 is just 0. So this evaluates to i pi over 2. So the logarithm of a complex number i is i pi over 2. Let's try another example. Let's try to find the logarithm of 1 plus i. Well, again, using the formula above, that's just the logarithm of the absolute value of 1 plus i plus i times the argument of 1 plus i. Let me quickly draw another picture. And 1 plus i is this point here. So that's 1 plus i. OK, well, clearly I've got a, a right angled triangle here. So if I drew some side lengths here, I've got a side length of 1 here and 1 here. Well, firstly, what's the modulus of 1 plus i? Well, by Pythagoras' theorem, I know that this length has to be root 2. So the logarithm of the absolute value of 1 plus i is just the logarithm of root 2, because 1 squared plus 1 squared equals 2, and by Pythagoras' theorem, I've got to take the square root of both sides, so this is of root 2. Now, how about the argument of 1 plus i? So if I label this as theta, equivalently, what is theta? Well, I know that theta is just the inverse tangent, or the arctangent, of 1 over 1. So the opposite side over the adjacent side. And that's just the arctan of 1. And I hope you agree that the arctan of 1, or you can use a calculator, is just pi over 4. So the argument of 1 plus i is pi over 4. So that's plus i pi over 4. And if you wanted to, you could simplify this further by just noting that, that root 2 is 2 to the power of a half, which is half log of 2. So you could write half log 2 plus i pi over 4 if you wanted to. You could leave it in this form if you wanted to. So the log of 1 plus i, that's a complex number, is a half log 2 plus i pi over 4. Okay, that's my video on the complex logarithm. So if you liked what you saw, make sure you like it, subscribe it, and leave a comment, comment below if you have any requests. See you then.